those of you later on on YouTube. Uh, we count it a blessing to be able to minister uh, beyond the walls of our church. Yes. And we're thankful only when we get to heaven will we know what that means. Yes. And so we're glad to have uh, all of you here. Uh, it's always a privilege to be able to open the Word of God and to minister uh, the truths that are found therein. And uh, it is God's word from cover to cover. Yes. It is God's truth from Genesis to Revelation. And uh, the tabernacle, I think we'll find as we go through, has uh, many hidden things that on a, just an arbitrary reading, uh, or a, as uh, Jerome and I like to say, a flyover, uh, mostly me, he likes it because I say it. But I fly over. And, uh, but, uh, you know, that's usually how we read a lot of the Old Testament when uh, we read maybe through the Bible in a year. Uh, we try to fly over the Old Testament about as quickly as we can. And uh, try not to stumble too bad as we get in some books that's one name after another name after another name. So, uh, we're here tonight, and uh, uh, we are uh, Midway Baptist Church, uh, located uh, in Athens, uh, Alabama. And so uh, we're going to just ask that uh, God be with us tonight, and uh, let's just ask him for a blessing. Lord, we thank you for your grace, and Lord, uh, we thank you that we can come to you I admit that uh, I don't come near as often as I should. And I think many others are in that same boat. Uh, Lord, but uh, we love you. We thank you for our salvation. Uh, we thank you for this study that has such great implications uh, of your righteousness and of your love for us. And that uh, uh, it was your move to make fellowship with man from the Garden of Eden all the way through Abraham and now today the church. Lord, we just thank you that uh, you care for mankind. And we know that uh, you care so much that we read the angels would want to look into this, why uh, our Savior became a little lower for a moment of history than, than they were to save us and yet knowing that we say that, that in his humanity he never stopped being God and so Lord we thank you for your love for your grace and as we study the tabernacle Lord give us insights give those who are studying with us insights into the word uh, may they find uh, that the Old Testament has so many good things and that many of the truths of the New Testament are hidden in the Old. Yes. And the New Testament reveals many of those as, as Paul and others explain how those things worked. Uh, just as Paul said, the rock that was in the wilderness was Christ, that it was a type of him. And we know that uh, he is the one that gives us the water of life yes. and gives us eternal life uh, in his death, burial, and resurrection. So Lord, we ask tonight, be with us in our study, and we'll thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. 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 All right, uh, we're looking at the tabernacle, and uh, we're going to be uh, uh, looking at uh, the outer, outer part of it, the fence. Uh, and you say the fence, uh, you know, I thought we'd be studying some of those other pieces. But I wanted you just to see that I believe that this was what was already in heaven. And we, we see that God says to them, uh, you know, do this just as you were told, just as uh, was seen by you. Now, I wanted to just show you here. It says 100 cubits long, 50 cubits by 5 cubits. Now, it's not hard to get feet out of that. 
the average cubit, uh, it's a measurement from here to here, and uh, uh, the average would be maybe 18 inches. Uh, now there's variances dependent, you know, on some people, but average we'll say is 18 inches. So if that's the formula, average, what you do with that, if you have 100 cupids, you just divide it in half, which is what? 50, and then add 100 and 50 together, and what do you have? 150 feet. <clears throat> and so 100 cubits is 100 of 18 inch segments or 150 feet. And so uh, our measurement that we recognize today is uh, 150 feet long, 75 feet wide, and the fence was about seven and a half feet tall. And so uh, that was all around the courtyard of the tabernacle, much as this shows here. And we are going to be showing some of those. Now here's one of the references that I wanted you to see. Uh, Exodus 27, eight says, see that they are to make it just as it was shown to you on the mountain. So did uh, Moses come down and just decide, no, God said we're going to build him something. And guys, let's get the architectural committee together. And, uh, and you know they'd have never gotten it done the whole 40 years. But uh, uh, let's get this architectural committee together. And uh, let's uh, know Moses came down with exact references, the exact size, the exact furniture, the dimensions to everything from this outside, which many of us would read over and not think anything about. Uh, read over that fence and just, well, that's a fence. You know, we, uh, we live in an area where there's a lot of country and there's fences all over the place, all different kinds. And uh, uh, we're familiar with fence, but uh, I think every part of this tabernacle has some spiritual blessing in it. And we're going to try to pick it out and uh, find the little nuggets of gold as we go through. So this wasn't dreamed up by Moses and uh, his brother Aaron or by any of the Levites. Uh, this was to be made as it was what? Showing you on the what? On the mountain. And so uh, we know where it came from. And Exodus 27, 9 says, you are to make the courtyard for the tabernacle, make it hangs. And I'm using uh, the Holman here because it's one of the versions that does it in feet. And rather than keep converting all the time, uh, I just picked this one out so that uh, it would be smooth reading for us. You are to make the courtyard of the tabernacle, make the hangings, in other words, the fence bar, on the south of the courtyard out of finely spun linen, 150 feet long on that side. There are to be 20 posts and 20 bronze bases. The hooks and the bands and the, of the post must be silver. 27-11, then make the hanging on the north side. 150 feet long, there would be 20 posts, 20 bronze bases, uh, hooks and bands on the top of the post must be silver. Make the hangings of the courtyard on the west side. Uh, now that would be the back of the tabernacle area, the west side. Uh, 75 feet long, that was a solid solid wall, a solid fence. And it had 10 posts uh, and 10 bases. Exodus 27, 13 and 14, make the hangings of the courtyard on the east side towards the sunrise, 75 feet. Make the hangings on one side of the gate, 22 and a half feet, including their three posts 
and their three bases. 15, and make the hangings on the other side 22 and a half feet, including their three posts and their three bases. Now we got two sides. Uh, how big are the two sides added together? 45 feet. Yeah, 45 feet. Yeah. And uh, remember the back was 75. So uh, it's going to be uh, pretty obvious that uh, the screen or the gate at the opening is going to be what? We take 45 from 75 and we got what? 30 feet. 30 feet. Well, we don't have to guess on that either. The gate of the courtyard is to have 30 foot screen embroidered with blue, purple, scarlet yarn, and finely spun linen. It is to have four posts, including their four bases. All the posts around the courtyard are to be banded with silver and have silver hooks and bronze bases. The length of the courtyard is 150 feet and its width is 75 on each end and the height of the fence is seven and a half feet, all of it made of finely spun linen. The bases of the post must be bronze. And uh, we're gonna to begin to see uh, some of the things of how this reads, and uh, we're gonna kind of fly through a little bit of this because there's quite a, quite a few things I've put in this one. Uh, it was made of fine twine linen, we read. 150 feet by 75 by seven and a half foot tall. Linen represents God's righteousness. Uh, and of course, also the, can represent the righteousness of Christ. And uh, remember when Jesus came, he said, I always do what the Father did. Whatever the father was, he was. And so, matter of fact, uh, I said to you guys when we studied the book of Revelation, I believe the only only one of the Godhead that we will see physically ever is Jesus. God, God is infinite. God's through the universe. We all amen last week. We said the universe doesn't contain God, but God contains the universe. Uh, now, we, we will probably, well, I know we will. We'll see the Shekinah glory at the throne. Uh, we've read that in Revelation. We'll see the rainbow. We'll see the, the ones that surround the throne and the holiness of God. And uh, uh, I believe we'll see God as, as a Shekinah glory, uh, the brightness of his being uh, will be there. Uh, it's just like when the high priest once a year uh, met with God in the Holy of Holies, which will be a great study when we get to it. Uh, you think that was the only place God was at that point? No, no that, was a, that was a representation. Of, uh, and his representation, we said, was there 24 hours a day. Cloud by day and fire by night. Uh, his presence was always there with these Israelites. The fence uh, was, well, I believe, to keep sinners out. It was seven and a half feet. Uh, God's righteousness was taking place inside of this. Sacrifice and commitment and uh, his work and uh, his holiness and uh, no one except priests ever saw what happened inside the tabernacle itself. That was only the confines of the priest. And the Holy of Holies was the confines of one priest once a year when he took the blood offering into God for the atonement of the people. So uh, that Holy of Holies place wasn't something people rambled in and out of. We'll be seeing that as we come to it. Uh, the only entrance was the eastern gate. Uh, it's interesting, as far as I know, uh, Christ talks about coming out of the east. And the only gate that's shut up, uh, that, that 
last I know is the eastern gate of Jerusalem. Uh, our Savior is going to come from that direction. And uh, uh, pretty well been stoned over since uh, the days of his death. So the only entrance was that eastern, eastern gate side. And uh, any other way was death. Any other way was death. Uh, you, you, you weren't to crawl under. Uh, you weren't to try to crawl over. And uh, uh, God said there's only one way. And that's important in our study. The outer court fence. Jesus is our only way. In fact, he is the only way for all creation. Uh, he was the salvation to the Jew as well as the Gentile, us. And uh, uh, he's our Savior. Uh, Old Testament saints didn't go to heaven. We've had that study and we've had a number of weeks on it that they went to paradise. And I hear a lot of preachers still make that mistake of uh, making paradise and heaven the same thing. They are not the same thing. So uh, uh, Jesus is God's only way for Old and New Testament saints. Only way. Jesus said, "What? I am the way." Revelation 19:8 talks about the church and the righteousness of the church that they are to be arrayed in what fine linen. <clears throat> the armies of heaven are dressed in fine linen. In Revelation. Uh, and we have the righteousness of Christ by our salvation through him. You and I have got the Holy Spirit living in us. The third person of the Trinity who set up within us that we might live holy and righteous lives. The outer court's fence. The fence and gate were held up by 60 pillars. I'm still researching to see uh, if 60 has any key. There are 60s used in some portions of the Bible, uh, but I'm not ready to do anything with the 60 pillar count right now. But God doesn't usually do things frivolously. So uh, some of you that want to do some homework, uh, you can do that. Uh, take a look and uh, see if you find anything. Uh, the pillars were set in bronze bases, and that was emphasized again and again. Uh, bronze represents judgment. Represents judgment. As a matter of fact, we are going to have a study uh, later on on the different meanings of the colors that are in this and the different materials that are in this. Uh, we will have a study on that uh, one evening where we'll put all that together and so uh, but uh, bronze uh, speaks of, of judgment the top of the pillars uh, set in silver or silver caps on them and uh, uh, silver uh, be like hooks where they hooked the uh, linen to Silver represents usually redemption. We are bought with a price, right? We are bought with a price. Christ represents, I think, the pillar. The brass base speaks that he took my judgment. Amen? Every one of us that's saved tonight, Christ took our judgment. Uh, Christ stands there. I try to find uh, there's any more about the pillars that uh, those 60 posts that were around the tabernacle. The uh, only thing I can infer is that uh, they were acacia wood or, or shittim wood. That's the two different uh, translations of the word. And because uh, that's the wood that's used throughout the whole tabernacle uh, and everything else. And so uh, I believe my assumption should probably be correct that those posts as well would be the same wood they've used for everything else uh, in, in, in their making of things. 
And so uh, uh, Christ, of course, uh, as I said, the brass vase, uh, uh, he took our judgment. The silver top, uh, silver, like I said, is righteousness. It uh, speaks of righteousness uh, or uh, not righteousness, but redemption. The silver speaks of redemption, being bought with a price. And the fine linen, uh, we've already looked at two different verses that uh, book of Revelation speaks of we as Christians are going to be in fine linen. speaks of righteousness. Uh, the ones that are with Christ uh, show forth their righteousness with uh, the, the fine linen. And I, I'm not sure that it's uh, linen, linen, or if it's linen Shekinah glory, or what it is we'll be wearing throughout eternity. Because Adam Adam and Eve, I believe, got God's Shekinah glory by walking with him every day. And uh, uh, Moses, when he came off the mount, had God's Shekinah glory being in his presence. And uh, what better clothing could you have than God's glory? But uh, nonetheless, fine linen uh, represents uh, uh, righteousness. Christ took our judgment, uh, the bronze, and he provides redemption, uh, the silver. Christ is the only way, John 14, 6. Our righteousness is filthy rags, Isaiah 64 said. That's why we need his righteousness, amen? Yes. See, that's, that's why that's in there. If we come with our righteousness, we'll never get to heaven. That's kind of what that linen barrier means around, uh, I believe, the tabernacle. Uh, it's God's righteousness, God's protection uh, of what's going on inside the, the courtyard. The law cannot save us. Uh, that's one thing people are going to bring up to us, you know, about salvation. The law doesn't save us, nor does it keep us. Once we're saved, we become overcomers. The law was just meant to show us how sinful we were. And that it was uh, our, our need of getting salvation. I believe the law, the, I think the Israelites thought when God gave it to them, they said, well, we can keep that. That seems pretty simple, 10 rules. Uh, I believe I, I saw somewhere in my reading that scholars say that it wasn't just 10 rules that the Israelites went. There were some, I don't know, 400 or more of them uh, that, uh, that, that were part of the system of Judaism. And uh, uh, no one gets to heaven through the law. That's right. No one can be saved by the law. The Israelites thought it was their life raft and actually it was an anchor. Uh, when they tried to grab hold of it, they sunk. And it's, they saw their sins for what they were. And so uh, if you're a Christian today, the law did its job. Showed you, showed you that uh, you were a sinner, but it couldn't save you. It couldn't save you. Christ became sin that we might not that we might become righteous. Christ took our judgment to provide our redemption. Christ is the only way, and here's your verse. Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me except through him so Christ took our judgment in another way another verse our righteousness is filthy rags Isaiah 64 6 but we are all like unclean thing and all our righteousness is our like filthy rags we all fade as a leaf 
and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Isaiah said that in the latter chapters of, of the book of Isaiah. By the way, how many chapters are there in Isaiah? <laughs> how many books are there in the Bible? How many chapters are there in Isaiah? <laughs> Christ took our judgment to provide our redemption. According to Romans 3.20, the law cannot save it. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, how many will be saved? None. No flesh, no one will be justified in his sight. But by the law is the knowledge of sin. That's why it was given. Yes. Mankind uh, said, uh, well, we don't know what God wants us to do. How, 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 can, how can we be wrong? And so God gave him what he wanted him to do. And no one except Jesus has ever done it. All of us in this room, no matter how righteous you are and how good you were, how good a child you were through all your your young life and then married and so forth uh, there's not one of us in this room that has not told a lie and how many how many of the commandments do we have to break to be guilty one so we all admit that we've at least told a lie and we probably told it by the time we were three or four did you get in the cookie jar not me, Mama. <laughs> well, what are those crumbs on your face? Well, I think the dog was in there and he licked my face. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, and we could look just like cherubs when we did. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we, we, we have all failed the test. We have all failed the test. And thank God that his son came and didn't fail the test and uh, became our righteous savior. The outer court fence, Christ became sin. Remember we said that outer court fence, uh, the linen, represented righteousness we see that according to the book of revelation that the saints will be in white robes white fine linen and this was to be fine linen and i think it speaks of god's righteousness and the righteousness of course of his son uh, who came and represented him and uh, he was it says for he made him who, uh, the he there is who? God the Father. God the Father. Sometimes you need to read that in. Uh, you know, or at least know who you're talking about, the he. For God the Father made Christ who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God the Father in him Jesus Christ Christ is the one that uh, uh, the father put our sins on I can't even imagine that here's the holy son of God who has never never been tempted never never sinned uh, and uh, all of a sudden this pure holy one uh, at the time when he was on the cross when God the Father laid all the sins of all the world of all the ages on Jesus can you imagine it must have almost been crippling to his being and I think it was the last three hours that he, he had that our sins on him 
God places it, that's when the world got dark. And uh, that's when Christ cries out, you know, Eli, Eli, Sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I like to translate that. It might be a loose overhaul translation. But Father, why have you turned your back on me? For the first time, he knew what it was to be separate. Forever and ever and ever and ever they were together. And for three hours it wasn't. For three hours he wasn't. Because God, even in his son who he loved more than anything, he couldn't even look at him. Oh, Father, when I need you the most, why have you turned your back on me? And God even showed his displeasure with it by making it like night. Veiled his son from sight. I just can't imagine what that was to Christ's soul. You know? And sometimes we need to think like that. What he pay? <laughs> we think of always the suffering. You know, we watch that movie, The Passion, and, uh, you know, I have never seen anybody in any place that watched that. When I first watched it in a movie theater, when I was up, there weren't people talking and laughing and clapping and stuff when they walked out of there. Boy, everybody was somber. Quiet. When they saw Jesus and all that he went through for you and me. I think you need to make it personal for you and me, amen? amen. Not just sinners, you and me. The outer court fence. Christ became poor. This, is, this has become through the years uh, one of my favorite verses. And uh, Philippians 1.21 for years has been one of my favorite, but this has become one of my favorite verses. And I preach it like a Christmas message. You say you do what? Yeah, uh, here you, you see uh, that Christ uh, speaks of him coming down uh, if you read between the lines and becoming one of us he became a baby he was born in Bethlehem it says though our Lord was rich yet for our sakes he became poor he became poor as soon as he became a human being amen, amen. he became poor But this second part is so great. That you through his poverty might become rich. Yeah. We have the whole bundle here. Christ came. Lived 33 and a half years. And died. On a cross took our sins that you and I might be rich with him. You see, when he went back home, it says in Philippians chapter 2, as, as it went through all the things that Christ did in chapter 2 and talked about even dying on a cross, and I like to put a but in there because but changes the scene. Mm -hmm. You ever had anybody talk to you and say, boy, this is a fine person, but, but. that's what you were waiting for. Uh -huh. yeah. You know, <laughs> let me get the real thing here now. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name, amen? Amen. amen. That every knee should bow and every tongue should confess 
And so as we look at this, my Savior, who was rich, had the worship of heaven throughout all time. He made all things. He holds all things together. My God is an awesome God. Amen. And he was rich, rich in glory, rich in praise. The angels of heaven worshiped him, beings that we have never even seen worship him. I don't think any of us have had seen as a seraphim or a cherubim. I have to confess, I've never seen an angel. Though it sometimes says we see angels unaware. If we're open to it, I really believe I had a missionary one time. I was at a conference in a church, and this fellow, I didn't know him from Adam, uh, uh, was walking around and said, I don't have a place to stay tonight. I don't have money to go anywhere. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, and I said, well, you can go home with me. And I often thought, he said, some of the things were just for you. He said, I haven't eaten in a while. When he ate with us that evening. And uh, uh, maybe I did have an angel one time. That, uh, you know. And sometimes, you know, uh, we know angels can take human form. And I've thought about that because it just was peculiar. Never heard from him again. I don't know that anyone else ever saw him again. But uh, he ate at our table, slept in. It's always, you know, my my oldest son, you know, he always got kicked out of his bed, you know, <laughs> and uh, that's where missionaries slept. But. Uh, uh, just was of interest that uh, uh, had no provision, nowhere to go. Uh, no one picking them up, didn't seem to know what was going to happen with them. And uh, someone took them home. Uh, we just don't know. But I do know that our Lord Jesus, who was rich, became poor. That we who were poor might become rich. I like that. Yes. I like that. Yes. No matter how rich you are today, when we get in our Father's home, we will know riches beyond compare. Yes. We will know life as we have never known it. We will have new bodies, bodies that will do supernatural stuff. Bodies that won't have the big C. Or the big H.A. heart attack. Yeah. These bodies are wearing out, aren't they? Well, one of these days we'll have one that won't. That's right. No more cancer. I won't have to keep going down to the doctors and getting posted my gums and fake teeth on top of them and uh, uh, it's going to be great. I won't have any backaches anymore. That would be pretty good too. <laughs> but we, we, we live on planet Earth such a short time. The Bible says it's like a vapor. It's like a vapor. And I'd just like to encourage the folks that are here tonight, those of you who are listening to this, we don't have long on planet Earth. True. And you know, if you believe that, you know, you just live here, you die, and that's the end of it, that's not what my Bible says. My Bible says there's a judgment coming. And if 
If you've never received Jesus Christ, you're going to hear some awful words. Awful words. I don't know you. Depart from me. I think those are awful words. But I thank God we who do know him are going to live with him forever. Yes, amen. Live for him forever. So I hope you realize that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and how I use that is I do that at Christmas, and I mention, you know, that we we talk about joy and love and all and peace at Christmas, and I just said, uh, as I usually start this the message for that, let's add another word to Christmas, grace. It says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. I think that's a good Christmas word. Yeah. And so uh, as uh, we come to the conclusion of our study, uh, I pray that as you've seen these verses, uh, those of you who are listening to us on air, again, this has been from uh, Midway Baptist Church in Athens, Alabama. And uh, we invite you to church at 11 o'clock every Sunday. Uh, Sunday school uh, we still uh, are not doing an evening service and uh, but we are doing a Wednesday service and I'm here and the pastors here and, uh, and there's a good group of folks here but uh, I pray that if you've been touched by this uh, may you look into the Bible and find that Jesus is your answer and whatever you think about it, I do know that for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. 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 May I ask a question? It's not time yet. <laughs> <laughs>